he you know he alluded to that a few times that he never thought this recovery would go or not the recovery but this um boom would go on so long he never thought that uh these companies would go to this high of a level but they are here and um yeah he (laughs) a couple times mentioned something like I don't really know <laughs> what's happening here, but we're going with it. And somebody well, asked him about valuations, like being so high. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he just immediately said, well, the companies we bought, we don't think the valuations are too high. Full right. stop. And then he also said that interest rates are like gravity to stock markets. And yeah. so if you if you parse that out, essentially what that means is that and and Warren basically said, if I was an athlete, I'm not an athlete, but if I had the gravity of the moon around me, I would be effectively an Olympic world class athlete. I would I would be able to do magnificent things that I can't really do with gravity. And I think the point is that the market is doing magnificent things entirely as a result of the removal of gravity by the Federal Reserve. They've dropped interest rates down to zero, going toward negative interest rates on some short-term stuff that, you know, 40, 50 years ago wasn't even conceivable in the top economic books in the world. Yeah, yeah, he pulled out that book. That was pretty funny. Right? And so we're looking at a point in time where he's not ready to make a market call, or he's not interested in making a market call. He doesn't really do that. And say that this is absurd. I'm not. I mean, can we just this. agree? He totally was making a market call. Like, yeah, he was totally four years ago. Call. Like, he totally four years was. Ago, 2017, <laughs> he'd made a market yeah. call that this isn't going to last. There's going to be an economic yeah. storm. Get ready to. He get has ready to pick stopped up the gold. with that language. He has, and and yet here we are with this anti gravity machine going on, and he just doesn't know how long it can keep going on. But Charlie's much more forthcoming, and he was very blunt about it. It will end in disaster, period. (laughs) (laughs) Stop. Full stop. It will end in disaster. I'm not going to say when, but there is a disaster. (laughs) And then then you look at what, and obviously one of the most important things to do with Buffett is to not only look at what he says, because he's always, often soft-pedaling things. Look at what he's doing. And what he's doing is trying to find something he can buy. And the only thing he could buy with any kind of real money last year at all during the pandemic, when things were crashing, the only thing he felt comfortable buying was Berkshire. That was it. He bought $25 billion of Berkshire. He sold other stuff. He didn't try to jump in at the bottom of the market. Charlie said, you know, we he, good luck trying to do that with hundreds of billions of dollars. We don't know how to do it. Um, and we had some deals that we thought were going to go. And then the Federal Reserve changed everything and kicked in a whole pile of money. So we didn't really do anything. Well, they did. They bought a crap load of Berkshire stock mm-hmm. and they sat on cash. And everybody forgets, but cash is an investment. It's an asset. When you're putting your money into something, it's an investment. And you're putting your money into 100 and at this point in time, $145 billion of cash. And then Buffett parsed that a little bit when Becky Quick asked him, you know, hey, that's a lot. Are you going to say He did, yeah. He said, well, it's not as much as it looks like because we want Berkshire to be a fortress against collapse, which will tell you the next, right? Do watch what he set, watch what he does. He is locking up ballpark $60 billion for Berkshire to have in cash for when it hits the fan. That's three times more than he's ever carried for that purpose. He's always 20 billion is about the maximum. And that means he's got 80 billion left that he wants to put someplace. And that's what he said. He I said, got, I've got I about think he said 70. He, he was looking to put 70. 70 to 80. Yeah. Um, and he yep. specifically, as soon as he said that uh, he wasn't sure what was going to happen in the, you know, all that sort of platitude, platitude, platitude. Then he immediately, right after that, to your point, said, so we have chosen companies that are capital rich, high margin companies like Apple. Yeah. Um, he said Apple's a better business than Berkshire because it has such high margin. Throws off more cash. Yeah. And I took that and I thought to myself, I could release all of my 
fancy checklists and, you know, all the things we've spent years talking about. And if you just follow that, I bet I could find maybe like one or two companies. It's not going to be a lot out of the thousands available, but a couple of companies that are really capital rich, high margin companies with great management. Like this is what they've been teaching us. Right. And like, that's it. And then just hold them for a long time through the disaster. That's not, that's not that hard. Yeah. And I, I and mean, I think that's what, what they're doing. I mean, they're investing in, that's exactly what they're in doing. companies that are going, and he said something, I'm trying to remember the word, but he said something around interest. Like after he talked about how the interest rates are so low that, um, that they're like anti-gravity to the stock market, that as they then go up, they will be like, more gravity to the stock market and companies that uh that have so much cash that have such a great bank account for case of emergency are suddenly not going to have to be borrowing they're not going to have to be paying on current debt higher rates than they're used to and they are going to suddenly look genius and in a class of their own Right. And I had never 100%. quite put that together in my mind. I had thought about it a bit like, oh, you know, we talk a lot about how debt is dangerous, but I had never quite put that together. And I mean, it's so simple and so obvious. What else is there to talk about for the rest of the semester? Like, right. let's all go home. That's so genius. And that's how Berkshire is. Genius. They're keeping money around. They're investing huge amounts in infrastructure, literally infrastructure for the future through railroads and energy. And he made so many points about that and had Greg talk about that over and over. So wait, let me parse that yeah, for a second. Ahead. So first, the first thing is cash. Okay. That's huge. That's whether it's you, if you're Berkshire or, or you, right? And it's investing in companies that produce cash. And by the way, there's another element to producing cash. These companies are all inflation proof. Every one of them. They're all big moat. They can raise prices um, with inflation. uh, That seems like a big statement to some extent. To some extent. Check it out. I think you'll see that almost everything in the portfolio I mean, that's almost the definition of a moat is that you can raise your prices. Why? Because you have something no one else has and you've got a bunch of people who are going to buy it, right? It's the old Coca-Cola can raise its price by a, by a penny. and Yeah, but they can't raise to, their price by 10 bucks, you know? like it has No, but they can if... <laughs> what are you just saying? <laughs> that if, if prices rise to Coca-Cola by $10 a bottle that they can't raise their prices to $10.12? Or, th- or to to eleven dollars? Yeah, they can. Oh, they have for the entire hundred year history. Inflation would be make it appropriate for that to be the price. Absolutely, got it, got it. I mean, if the sugar prices or corn syrup, whatever they're using, go through the roof, which they have in the past, they just raise their prices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people go buy it. I guess. And I, I, I t- I'll tell you, we, you know, we, we these guys didn't talk that much about inflation, but uh, you know, it's coming. Uh, there's no question about it. Um, I was just listening to Michael Burry talk about inflation. Burry is, of course, the guy we've talked about before on here who made a really good call on shorting uh, mortgage bonds Mm -hmm. and made billions of dollars. Very, very smart guy. And, I mean, (laughs) contrary to Buffett, Burry is buying farmland. So (laughs) (laughs) Burry thinks hyperinflation is on the way. So if we're not going to go out there and buy farmland, if we want public companies, then you don't want the entire market. If you if you don't have any idea how to invest, of course you have to buy the entire market. Go buy the SPX and be in the game. Stay on the ship. That's Buffett's advice. I don't disagree with it. Um, most people are not going to be investors, but you are not most people. If you're listening to this, you are definitely not most people. You're weird. <laughs> and and exactly. you're obviously looking <laughs> to understand how to invest. Well, understanding how to invest is not hard. That's the crazy thing about it. And and these two guys are brilliant, but they will tell you over and over again. I just watched a, um, a really interesting uh, video of Buffett from 1981 or something. It was his first TV appearance. And, you know, what did he talk about? Well, you know, this kind of investing doesn't require a high IQ. This is not where, you know, somebody really smart wins. 
You guys, if you enjoyed this video and you feel it was valuable in teaching you more about how to invest, hit the like button and please share the video with your friends. And if you want more investing content, subscribe to my channel. And don't forget to click the button on the screen. We got a free gift for you. Thanks again for watching.